print on my flight ticket to Rwanda says, we are not responsible for your life. And the atmosphere on board the United Nations cargo plane, it feels like a global fest. Blue helmets, blue berets, blue turbans, and I'm having a party in my head. Or as a real Glaswegian would say, I'm having a wee party in my head, I the new am. I climb over the dozens of feet to get to this open air bathroom. It's got no door or ceiling, it's just a short curtain and I draw around me and everybody watches my feet stick out as I pee with excitement. I've landed my dream job as a UN human rights activist. And I arrive in Kigali as the humanitarian freak with full blown chicken pox and a suitcase full of tea bags. I'd been too scared to tell anyone that I was feeling really ill in case they wouldn't let me go. My parents are horrified at my career choice. But Jennykins, my dad says, you can type more than 85 words a minute. <laughs> Don't waste those skills. I've absolutely no clue of what I'm about to encounter. All I know is that I can't stop scratching. And at the airport, I meet this guy called Agbasi from Benin in West Africa on his fourth UN mission. And he shepherds me past the military, waving our blue UN passports in their faces. And as part of our initiation into Rwanda as UN human rights observers, we visit a prison. 8,000 men, women, and children are being held in a space built for 500 and they're all accused of the worst crimes against humanity. Don't enter if you can't handle it, they tell us. Yesterday, someone vomited. There's no room to vomit. And don't cover your noses and disrespect the prisoners if you can't handle it, because yesterday, someone fainted. There's no room to faint. Try combining putrid gutters, unwashed bodies, and gangrene infected limbs, and you might get a whiff of it. So I enter the prison terrified. Maybe I'm going to discover that I'm a human rights activist in theory, but not in practice. And Agbasi, he's chit-chatting, strolling about, chatting with the inmates as if he's catching up on lost times. Everyone's wearing prison uniforms of bright pink shorts and shirts, the heat and smell are overpowering. And the space, or lack of, I mean, try and imagine four people standing in a space the size of a Monopoly board, 24 hours a day. 16,000 eyes peer at me from dark, humid, overcrowded cells. And wanting to feel useful, I start clumsily crisscrossing the endless bare legs and feet. I'm trying not to step on anyone's toes. But it's impossible to tell which limbs belong to which person. I randomly ask one guy, Amakuru, Nimeza, what's your name? Innocent. <laughs> oh, I'm not here to decide if you're innocent or guilty. I'm here to make sure that you get food and medical treatment see a judge, have a fair trial. What's your name? Innocent. Agbasi comes up behind me grinning. He explains that innocent is one of the most common names in Rwanda. And then he pulls me aside to hear the other stories. A Hutu woman tells me that she threw her babies into the river because they were half Tutsi. And a man confesses that he chopped off people's arms and legs with a machete. And he was so tired and drunk, he had to come back the next day just to finish them off. I talked to teachers accused of killing their pupils, nuns of killing churchgoers, doctors their patients. And at this point, I don't sense that people necessarily regret what they've done. But nor do I think that they understand why they did it. And I wish that I could give you an answer to the question that must be in your head, but how can I explain how an ordinary person turns into a brutal killer? 
I can't do my job if I allow myself to focus too much on the why. These people are considered scum of the earth, malicious murderers accused of genocide and war crimes. But no trials have taken place yet. What if they aren't guilty? Or what if they are? When you live for long periods of time in conflict zones, it's easy to get lulled into a false sense of security. And when something happens to someone else, that's exactly how it feels. It feels like something's happening to someone else. And it's hard to imagine that the next incident might involve you, until it does. I'm attacked by rebels in Rwanda by the ones who carried out the genocide. And you might think that it's hard for me to tell this story, but in fact, it feels quite surreal. And maybe I believe that the more times I tell it, the more surreal it will become. They come pounding through the door, about 10 of them dressed in half-baked military uniforms, wielding AK-47s and hand grenades. They yank off my belt, yell at me to remove my shoes and grab my bag and security radio. That's my only chance to call for help. And they're doing the same thing to Nestor, our interpreter, and Massimo, an Italian human rights monitor. This all takes seconds before they drag us outside and shove us onto our knees. One guy, he's clearly the leader, he screams at us in French, Pourquoi vous êtes venu ici? Qu'est-ce que vous voulez? Why have you come here? What do you want? and the others are screaming at Nestor in Kenya, Rwanda, so I can't understand. And if I've got any doubt about how serious they are, well, these doubts are wiped off by the back of their hand on my face. And more than the pain of the unexpected surprise, I feel humiliation. Hundreds of village eyes are staring at me blankly. They look so indifferent and I feel angry that they say and do nothing. I watch them kick and slap Nestor and Massimo, who's lost all the color in his face. And for every whack I get, they get three. And I talk a lot, pleading with a gun against my head. Let us go. We haven't come here to do any harm. Just let us go and we won't come back. But what I really wanted to say was, you fucking bastards. I'm in this country helping your fathers and sons and brothers who are languishing in prisons accused of genocide. I'm investigating human rights abuses by the very government you're fighting against. You've got the wrong goddamn people, I want to scream. But I don't. We are going to kill you. They keep telling us over and over again, we are going to kill you. I watch them talking nervously, and I know without a trace of doubt that that conversation is about whether to kill us or not. And so I sit there, looking at them decide if I will live another day. And they are panicking, glancing at one another, pacing around, deciding. And I glance at the bystanders, wondering if anyone is gonna do anything. And then all of a sudden they come running up to us, and all I can see are hand grenades, and they throw our shoes at us and yell, go. Just go, now. And so we start running before they can change their minds, and I'm bracing myself for a bullet in the back. And we run for such a long time, and then we walk for hours before we eventually find help. And you know what haunts me about that day? It isn't what happened. It's what didn't happen. And our attack is then reduced to this ridiculous set of moments when I call the credit card company to report my stolen card. Where was your card stolen, madam? In the forest, in the northwestern part of Rwanda. Do you know who stole your card? <laughs> yes, a group of rebels called the Interhamway. Can you spell that last word, please? I for India, N for November, T for Tango, E for Echo, R 
Look, I wouldn't be able to recognize their faces. I was trying not to look at them for fear maybe they would kill me if I could identify them. Would you think they might have used your card? <laughs> no. They live in the forest. There aren't any shops in the forest. Well, did you report your card stolen then? Yes, to a group of the military, and they went in, and, and I heard they, they probably murdered some of the rebels. Well, were the soldiers able to recuperate your card? I don't know. I was more focused on trying to get my brand new car back until I discovered that they blew it up. Oh dear, was your credit card in the car? <laughs> no, it was in my bag. They put a gun against my head and snatched it from me. I never asked for it back. That sounds unpleasant. <laughs> Did you give them your PIN number? <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. Well, there's no need to be sarcastic, madam. Just trying to help. By the way, where shall we send your new card? Scotland. I'm due for a holiday. So I head back home to Glasgow, and I wasn't planning on telling my parents about the attack until it showed up in the press that week. Of course, I play it down big time. It's just a wee run in with a rowdy bunch of hooligans who probably had a banana beer too many. I gave them a piece of my mind and I set them on their merry way. They won't be tracking me down again. And we sit drinking tea, watching the BBC News report one humanitarian disaster after another. Jennykins, my dad says, you're a smart cookie. You'll never be out of work. And then we hear the headlines of the next news report. Tragedy in Rwanda. Five UN human rights observers have been killed in an ambush by Hutu rebels. And I see the pictures of my colleagues, Sastra and Graham. Sastra is a Cambodian who fought the Khmer Rouge. Graham is a fellow Brit, a former missionary engaged to a Rwandan genocide survivor. The reporter explains that inter Hamway rebels blocked their car on an isolated road and sprayed it with bullets. Sastra tried to make a run for it, so they not only killed him, they decapitated him. This day changes my life. More than being attacked myself, because I know that if I had been killed, they would still be alive because the UN would have withdrawn from the region. And on this day, I'm forced to confront the reality that this job can kill you. And as much as I know I won't stop, I know I don't want to die for it. I see my mother standing in front of my coffin, which is draped in the UN flag, and my brother losing his baby sister I don't even allow that thought to fully form in my head. And my dad, my dad telling everyone how he begged me not to leave if I just listened, if I just come home. Jennykins, we Jennykins, please come home. But right now, I can feel my parents' relief. Our daughter is lucky to have come out alive. The Rwanda saga is finally over and I'm right there with them. I feel liberated. I mean, I feel a weight lifted from my shoulders that I didn't even know was there until it was gone. Most human rights observers, they last a few months in Rwanda. I've been there for two years. I've done my time. And Agbasi calls to tell me that due to the increased security risk in the country, they're downsizing the whole UN operation. Those who don't want to stay are being asked to leave, and the others are being let go. He asks me to come back. When my dad realizes that my mind is made up and he can't change it, he stops talking to me. My mum starts taking sleeping pills. There is a hell of a lot of tea drinking going on in my house right now and nobody speaks on the way to Glasgow Airport. 
and when I pass through the departure gate, I can't look back at my parents standing there wondering if they're ever going to see me again. And I avoid all eye contact with other passengers and security personnel because I know if someone says one word to me, I'm going to burst into tears. And any doubts that I might be having, well, they're magnified when I arrive at Kigali Airport. And I try to communicate with my friends through the soundproof glass wall as they wait in the departure lounge. Massimo blows me a kiss back, and he points to my rash. And now I have something new to contend with, fear. And I wish I could answer the question in your head, but I don't know why I go back. It takes another year for me to realize that it's time to leave Rwanda. And so I moved to Haiti. <laughs>